Hey, how's it going? My name's Kurt and I made this video in, a, in an attempt to explain what an SPWM signal is as well as how to implement it on common micros. Um, if you don't know what an SPWM signal is, it's a signal an inverter would use to take a DC voltage and chop it up into an AC voltage. So I've got the SPWM working on an Arduino, but I've also provided code that should work on many Atmel micros apart from the Duino IDE. All of the code used in this video as well as some documentation can be found on GitHub. There'll be a link in the description. So in the video, I'm first going to demo the signal and then we'll go over some brief theory. Uh, in particular, I want to go over how PWMs are typically implemented on microcontrollers and then that'll roll into my explanation of the code. So we'll, we'll walk through the code. Uh, this video only covers fixed frequency SPWM. However, there will be a second part which will cover a variable frequency SPWM. All right, here's the signal. Uh, so this is it. Uh, I've got one probe here which is um, on the one of the pin signals, so only half the signal here. Um, and the other probe is just on another pin which is toggling every period of the 50 hertz signal which I'm using for a tr as a trigger on the uh, oscilloscope. Uh, so here it is. Um, you can see there's the thin pulses on the edges here and the thick pulses kind of just all blend together in the middle. And this uh, little line down here is just the, the signal that I'm triggering off. So I can zoom in a little bit, but it, it's only it's not that effective. But again, thin to thick, that's, that's what we're going for here. So if I connect the ground to the other, the other pin, the other side of the signal, I do get the full signal there. It's jumping around a bit because of the PWM. It's, there's not a clear trigger, but you know you get the you get the full signal. Now we're going to filter it. So what I've done is I've uh, connected um, a pot meter in series with a capacitor, and I'm running the probes across the capacitor. And essentially, what this gives me is a variable RC filter. So um, as I turn the pot one way, you can see all those spikes to start coming back in, um, almost to the point where it gets back to as bad as it was before. So yeah, once you smooth it out, um, smooth out the higher frequency, that, uh, you get you get your sinusoidal, sinusoidal wave almost almost perfect. Uh, so now we're going to go over a little theory. So I'm pretty much going to assume you know what a PWM is. Uh, in power electronics, it's it can be a way for a digital system output an analog value. So for example, this PWM has a duty cycle of 60%. So the output voltage ends up being the 60% of the input voltage, at least ideally. And so an SPWM can be created by dynamically changing the duty cycle on a PWM as shown in this figure. You might notice that this image shows negative pulses, which is not possible with a PWM. However, we are going to implement the signal by using two pins. One pin pulses the positive half of the signal, and the other pin pulses the negative half of the signal. The reason why we're going to do this is because it makes it compatible with a H-bridge. Let me explain. A H-bridge is what's used to uh, invert uh, a load um, with a DC, from a DC source. So if you don't know what it is, you can Google it, but they're pretty simple. If you, if we just turn on the two diagonal switches um, at the same time, then what that, what that does is it allows the current to flow through the load in one direction, and if you turn those off and turn on the other opposite two, then it'll allow the current to flow through in the opposite direction. Now these switches, I've just uh, represented them as simple switches, but they can be power MOSFETs or whatever. Now there's two ways uh, you could wire this up um, which would be compatible with our signal being split across two pins. Uh, the first would be is uh, if we take this as an input to the to the switch, um, whether it be a MOSFET or, or a power transistor, whatever. Um, so that turns it on, and this turns this one on. We wire those together, and similarly we do the same with this one and this one. Then. <coughs> Whenever this is turned on, these two turn on and it allows it to go through this way and when this is on, it allows it to go through the opposite direction, which would work with ours. You can also um, wire them up like so. You put a NOT gate in here and a NOT gate in here. And this way, uh, this way also works with our two signals. Okay, so before we have a look at the code, I want to quickly go over how a PWM is typically implemented on a microcontroller. So uh, it all happens with these two values, and that's that's what you want to remember. So um, if this is a, a time axis along here, this blue line is going to be a counter. So this increments every clock cycle, and when it gets to a certain value, 
which here it's going to be 1000, it resets. There is a second value and this is uh, typically called something like an output compare. Um, and on these two values uh, we can tell the micro to uh, uh, do something to a pin. So for example, so as you can see here, um, when this is reset, we set this pin here to high. So every time this is reset, we get, a, we get this set to high. And on the output compare value, it's set to low. So the pin is set to high, this, this uh, value increments up. When it gets to 500, it's set to low. It keeps going, once it's reset, the pin gets set to high. And this gives us a PWM. Now it's important to, to note that our, uh, our frequency and duty cycle is affected by these two values. So the frequency comes from this value because this value is going to be your period in clock cycles. So if you have a one megahertz clock, then your frequency is going to be uh, the clock speed. So one million divided by this value here, which equals one kilohertz. So that'll be your switching frequency. And the um, duty cycle is going to be given by a ratio between these two. So you know, 1,000, uh, sorry, yeah. 500 divided by 1000 is going to equal 0.5 which you know is a 50 50 percent duty cycle now these two values co correspond to registers in the micro and for the chip we're going to be using the Arduino one uh, this is going to be the register ICR1 and this will be uh, there's two registers um, OCR1A and OCR1B for two different output pins. Uh, with that, let's have a look at the code. Okay, so now I'm gonna walk you through this code. Uh, this is the SPWM basic. You can find this on GitHub. Uh, what I try to do with this code is just get the SPWM implemented as simply and <coughs> with as least lines as possible. So um, what I'm gonna do is go through the most important parts of the code first. So hope you get an idea conceptually and then I'll fill in the gaps line by line. Okay, so I'm immediately going to refer back to this sawtooth-like diagram, um, similar to the one I covered before. As I was saying um, in that, is that the PWM characteristics are determined by these two values. Um, there's three here, but really these two are grouped together in some ways. This is appropriate that they are because we're using two as well, two pins. So uh, this, the, f the top value here, the value at which the counter resets, uh, sets the period of the PWM, and that is implemented in the code by loading um, a number into this register. So we're using the same number here, 1600. So 1600 with a 16, this is a period in clock cycle, so with a 16 megahertz uh, crystal, that ends up giving us a switching frequency of 10 kilohertz, which divides our 50 hertz sine wave into 200, 200 bits, pieces. Um, okay, so that gives us our our, uh, our period or frequency of the PWM and the duty cycle or high time, more correctly high time is determined by these two values and they determine the high time of two pins. So these pins on the Arduino Uno correspond to pins 9 and 10 and that's done by loading values into these two registers here, OCR1A and OCR1B. So the way we get the sinusoidal output is by dynamically changing the high time every single period of the PWM. And this is done by running a running this interrupt service routine for every period. So every time this uh, counter resets or overflows, then um, this interrupt service routine is run. And during when it's run, we have an opportunity to load a new value into this register every single time. So we load a new value in by looking using a lookup array. And this num here that points to a, a number in the array is incremented every single every single interrupt. So these lookup tables are up here and they simply correspond to uh, the sine wave. So th the first one, like I said, we're, we're, like I mentioned earlier, we're splitting the signal across two pins. So the first pin um, starts off with a sine wave, it ramps up, it goes back down, and then when it gets back to zero, it stays on zero and just zero all the way across. And the second one does kind of the opposite. It starts off with zero, uh, first half of zero, and then it, then it starts to do the sine wave, it ramps up and ramps back down. Um, it's worth noting here, I'll see if I can find it. Uh, here, the max value of this sine wave, uh, the max value in this lookup table was 1600, which is equals the same value as this period. So right at the, the, the peak of the sine wave 
uh, the the width of the PWM is is the full width of the, the PWM, which makes sense. Um, so that is, or oh, the only other thing le left to cover is that. Uh, so we increment the number, but we also check that it's below or equal to 200. If it happens to be equal or uh, happens to be equal or or above 200, then it means that we've reached the end of the lookup table. So we need to reset it so that it can just repeat what it was doing over and over again. And that that is conceptually it. We set our we set our period here, and then we dynamically change the high time every interrupt service routine, and we reset it when it gets over 200, so they can just repeat doing anything. That's that's all you need to know. Um, but I will. I'm just going to cover some other little parts of the code that make it all work. So uh, there are two headers at the top. The I/O header is necessary because we're addressing registers directly here. And the interrupt header is necessary because we're using um, this micro-specific uh, interrupt service routine. The lookup tables I've already covered, but it's worth noting that we're using 400 ent entries in total of int values, so that ends up being 800 bytes, which is close to half the dynamic memory. Not a problem with this code, but it could be a problem if you were trying to do other things in this code. Uh, moving on, these three registers um, are what we're using to set up the PWM the way we want it. So if you really want to understand what's going on here, um, I'd have commented it reasonably well, but you may want to look at the 328p data sheet. But conceptually, I can just tell you that we're, this bit pattern is, is setting up for us a, um, a counter that has no prescaler, and it sets the output pins to high when it resets and back to low on, on a compare match. It also runs an interrupt service routine um, every time the counter overflows. This register we've already gone over. This, p this function here just enables global interrupts, which is necessary. Um, this here, I'm setting the two pins to outputs. And the reason why I'm doing it this way instead of using the, the typical Arduino pin mode is because I wanted to make it specific to the um, chip or the Atmel family so that if you put it on another chip or the, even the same chip on a different board, you guaranteed that it'll still work, um, whereas it may not um, because they, the, the pins differ in terms of the Arduino pins from board to board. An example of this working or being portable is I did actually upload this to a, uh, a Mega 2560 Arduino board and it worked without changing a single thing, ported right over. The only thing I had to do was look at a schematic to determine which pins were outputting, but it, it, it worked without a, without a brief. Um, so moving on, this pin mode here, which continues on down to here, where basically what we're doing with this, we're first setting the, the, the pin 13 to an output, and then these two lines um, toggle that pin every time that this number is reset. And the reason why we're doing this um, is because uh, it's got nothing to do with the SPWM signal itself, but it makes it very convenient to look at the signal on an oscilloscope because we can use the pin 13 as a trigger point. but it's not necessary in any way. And that's it. The only thing I'll mention is that the loop does nothing. Um, all the good stuff happens in this interrupt service routine. So that's it. I hope you understand. I will go on to explain um, some more code that implements a few more features, but this is, this is it in essence. Um, if you understand this, you pretty much understand how, how SPWM is implemented on a microcontroller or can be. So now I'm going to be explaining this code. It's the SPWM generated lookup uh, table code. You can also find some GitHub. Um, it's going to pretty much go through it in order, but I might jump around a little bit. So uh, first of all, these are same headers as the last bit of code, the SPWM basic code. Um, I am using, uh, the, there should also be a header here, the math.h header, because I'm using these math.h functions. However, Arduino seems to include it by default or checks it if you need it and includes it if you do. Either way, it doesn't seem to be necessary in the Arduino IDE, but if you're using uh, just the Atmel chips, you might need to, but um, that's just a side note. Uh, so the sign divisions here, this variable, we, that or it's not a variable, but we set it to 200. Um, this is the amount of divisions we're going to have in the in the sine wave, or how much we're going to chop it up by, and it ultimately determines our switching frequency of the PWM. And because it, it does this by affecting the period, so right here we're we're calculating the period, and if we use the values that we've got up here, um, 16 times a million divided by 50, which is the frequency of the, the uh, sine wave divided by 200, 
the sign divisions, that gives us 1600, same as the last bit of code, and that gives us, that's the period in clock cycles, which gives us um, 10 kilohertz switching frequency. Um, so these are the variables, I, I've discussed this, this, as a period, the lookup table, we are setting to um, sign divisions, it should be divided by 2, it only needs to be 100 long. Um, this bit of code, not only are we uh, generating the lookup table, we're also halving the length of it. We Because we only need one half, um, you know, the last lookup table had all those zeros, where we're basically being a bit smarter about it, we're condensing it. So this only needs to be 100 long. This I'll get to, this has to do with how we're treating this register. So the way we're generating the lookup table is with this for loop. Um, initializing i to zero, it, it's incremented each time, and we check that it's below 100. So the number that's been incremented each time is times by 2 pi over the sine divisions. So this being sine divisions, this being sine divisions over 2 means we only get the first half of the um, waveform, but that's what we want. So this is going to return a value between 1 and 0, and we times that by our period. So when sine is 1 at pi over 2, then it gives us the full 1600 period, the full width of the PWM. Um, yeah, so then we are just casting that down to an int, uh, and we're using this little trick in C. Basically, when you cast a floating point to a integer, it just truncates the decimal points. So if you plus 0.5 before it truncating, it's uh, a, an efficient way of rounding. So there, yeah, that's how the, uh, the lookup table is generated. Um, so this is pretty much, the, these registers are pretty much the same as um, the, the SPWM basic code I was, we were looking at earlier. However, for this value we're using a variable and the bit pattern is slightly different. So it was 1010 zero, zero at the start, um, but the reason why it's only 10 is because we're only setting one of the compare outputs to begin with. So uh, I've, I've commented it, um, clear and match, set a bottom for comp A. Um, comp B dis disconnected initially, so it will be connected later, and this has to do with how we're how we're implementing this. So um, this is the same RCR one. We, we load in the period, except for we calculate the period up here. Um, enable global interrupt interrupts. Um, set PB one, PB two as outputs. Um, this is also the same, but it has nothing to do with the SPWM. It's for the oscilloscope. Can be ignored. Um, and here is the rest of the interrupt service machine this is well the juicy stuff happens so <coughs> um what i'm going to do i'm going to take these two lines i'm going to copy them and i'm going to paste them in here it's going to make things a little easier to explain that's what i want to do so in this um interrupt service routine it differs from the last one in that we only have one lookup table and we're loading the same value into these regs, both OCR1A and OCRB um, at the same time. Um, but how we split the sinusoidal sort of wave across the two pins like we had last time is we disconnect and connect the two compare outputs one at a time. So basically our lookup table is half as long, it's only, it's only 100 long and so we the num is incremented and we check that it's below Side divisions divided by 2 would end up being 100. Um, I say 100, assuming you've got this set, but you can change these and the code should work reasonably well. Um, you want to pick fairly round numbers, like 400 or 50 will work, but I'm not sure how you go with just random numbers. Anyway, that's a side note, you can change these, but I'm kind of using like the constant saying that this will be 100. It will be with this particular um, value. So, lookup tables are only 100 long, so when, if it's 100 or above, then we reset num to zero, and we toggle the pin. So what we do is we take this variable, which we've named similar to the register, and we toggle these two bits. And since we initially set them as one and zero, so we, we toggle them by using a um, XOR function, uh, XOR operator. Um, so it's set, it starts off with this being one and this being zero, it'll switch around, so this is one and this is zero, and that effectively just has the, um, the other pin activated. Now, um, I did paste these in here, um, and the reason why is, oh, I'll try and explain now. So, instead of being down here, they're up here. 
and the reason being is um, <clears throat> I'll try to explain by drawing. Here's my sawtooth thing that I love so much. Now we get our SPWM by dynamically changing the high time. So let's say it needs to be set here, here, and then here. So uh, our waveform ends up looking like this. Go, oh, shit. Goes up, and then gets set down, up a little longer, high time down, up even longer, high time down, up, etc. Um, and we actually have two of these. Um, you know, they do different things. In fact, one's disconnected altogether. But whatever, you get the point. This too. Um, now. The reason why we have written written it this way is because if I grab that red again. Um, so the inter interrupt service routine is run every time the clock overflows. So it's set, it runs say from the start here. So let's say it runs this long. Um, now, um, if you want to load a really narrow pulse width in like this, really narrow. If you were to try and do that here, directly below, you might try to set it when it's too late. So when we are setting these variables, so the you know the O, the register, sorry, the OCR one A, for example, we set it here, but it doesn't get implemented to the next period of the PWM. It buffers it, and and it's because if you need to load a very small value, being zero or one, then you can't possibly do it within this interrupt service routine. However, the I'll just say the we'll go back to blue. The the T C C uh, blah, 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 is done instantly. Boom. So we actually need to delay this to disconnect later, and we do that with this code. And the reason why we want to disconnect it later is because um, if this is loading in the last, uh, sorry, um, loading in the Oh, let's go to it. Let's say this is equal to uh, 100. So this gets set to zero, and this loads in the first value. Um, if we were to disconnect the pin straight away, then this value here wouldn't actually be loaded into the next interrupt service routine at the start of it. However, the pins would be disconnected straight away. So we would have some funny business going on at the zero crossing of our sine wave. So we have our sine wave, which would look like this. We might get this might get a funny spike here or something like that, that we don't want. Um, so we need to delay it the same. Since this is buffered, we need to essentially buffer this as well. And we do it by just delaying it one interrupt service routine or one period of the PWM. So the way we do that is we increment this variable here, delay one, we increment it by one. And then the next time that, the, so it goes from being zero to one, and the next time the interrupt service routine runs, we check if it is one, and if it's one, that's when we that's when we toggle it, or we, we change the output compares, and then we set delay one back to zero. So that's all that is, all that's happening there, but it's it's an important point, because otherwise you'll get funny bits at the zero crossing of the, the sine wave. So um, conceptually, again, one more time, um, the lookup table is generated here, and we load a new variable into these registers um, every single p period of the PWM to get our SPWM, when it gets to uh, the lookup table being half the sinusoidal, um, sinusoidal wave, we toggle the pins, but we also um, reset the lookup table. But we do the toggling one um, period later because of the fact that this is buffered by one period. And that's it. I, I hope you understand. So that's the explanation done. And the next thing you should do is watch the variable frequency SPW, SPWM video. Uh, the last thing I'd like to do is make a quick note on safety. Uh, if any of you plan on uh, making an inverter with this signal, I'd like to say just don't do it, but some of you will anyway. Uh, so if you are going to, please take basic safety precautions. Um, that being, at the very least, you want to make sure no part of the live circuit is able to be touched. Even if you think you're being careful, you just don't want to be able to touch it. Also, don't modify the circuit while it's live, and I recommend not doing it alone as well. Um, that's it. See you next time.